All right, Dr. Lane Norton, welcome to the Man Talk Show. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. Uh, thanks for having me on, Connor. I've followed your stuff for a while and uh, appreciate what you're doing in the men's mental health space. Thanks, man. Likewise, likewise. I think you are supporting a lot of men's mental health inadvertently and indirectly, but I think we're going to start there. So let's talk about the effects of stress on a man's body and the effects of stress on disease, which I think you know, you've know you talked about and one of the things that you touched on before. So let's just start there. Yeah. So my journey kind of like looking at this started with my experience with pain management. So I compete in powerlifting. I've done really well. I've master's world title. I've got silver medal at open worlds in 2015. I set a world squat record. I've won five national titles in total, but I went through about an eight year period where I struggled with, you know, pretty chronic back and hip pain. It also happened to coincide with the most stressful period of my life. And as I dug into pain literature, one of the things that really consistently popped up was essentially, I'm going to summarize like four decades of pain research, but essentially if you are under a lot of psychological stress, it drastically lowers your susceptibility to feeling pain. Pain is, we used to just think, oh, pain is proportionate to how much tissue damage there is. And that is not how it works at all. If if you think about pain as a gate and you can open or close that gate in terms of your sensitivity to pain, uh, one of the biggest levers is psychological stress. And in fact, you see people with fibromyalgia who are diagnosed with fibromyalgia, myalgia, one of the most consistent aspects of that is they're much more likely to have high levels of psychological stress and poor stress management. And one of the biggest levers that they pull in research for managing fibromyalgia is actually cognitive behavioral therapy. It's therapy. And so that got me really like looking more down this stress rabbit hole. And as I was struggling through this about two years ago, I left an extremely stressful relationship, which I'm, I'm sure it was very stressful for her too. It just didn't work for either one of us. And And within two weeks of leaving that relationship, I was stronger and had less pain. It was like, I got noticeably stronger in the gym. And I started thinking about it and I realized, well, I'm not walking on eggshells all the time. I'm not spun up all the time. I'm not like vibrating all the time. And I think we really discount, I think we used to think that like your brain was connected to your body, which is just a bag of meat. And if you punch the bag, cut the bag, burn the bag, poke the bag, your body goes owie or your brain goes owie, right? And now we know it's not like that at all. What happens in the mind affects the body and what happens in the body affects the mind. Um, and you need to look no further than this to see, again, the stuff on uh, fibromyalgia. Also, chronic fatigue syndrome, very high association with psychological stress. IBS, very high association with psychological stress and psychiatric disorders. It goes both ways on that. And when we look at going from the body to the mind, there was actually a study that just got published. Probably, I'm sure you saw it. I talked about it. It was like two or three months ago, but they had men who were diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder, just resistance train two times a week for 25 minutes. That's it. 50 minutes total a week. And they saw massive reductions. Like I don't use words like massive or huge, or I don't use those words very often as a scientist because I think they're just overused. Massive reduction in depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms. So we use in scientific research, what's called an effect size. So you have two different values that are really like our, like what we look at mostly Uh, a P value, which is determining whether or not something is significant. And that's essentially like, is it due to random chance or sorry, what is the probability? it's due to random chance or the treatment. And so we denote something of a P less than 0.05 is significant. And that just essentially means statisticians will cringe at this because I'm generalizing, but essentially it's true. There's less than the 5% chance that the effects we observed or the differences we observed between groups were due to random chance. And so there's over a 95% chance that it was due to the treatment, right? So it was very significant. That doesn't tell you anything about the effect size, which is how, how powerful is the effect. So if we look at SSRIs in scientific research, their effect size is about a 0.3 to 0.5. In the best case scenario, you might get a 0.8. And so just for reference, a small effect size is 0.2, 0.5 is considered a moderate, and then anything above a 0.8 is considered large. So it ranges from like low moderate to large for SSRIs. The effect size seen in this study of just 50 minutes resistance training a week was 1.7, which is absolutely freaking massive. So again, what happens in the body affects the mind and what happens in the mind affects the body. And when you also 
also look at, I'm sure you're familiar with the ACEs score, you know, adverse childhood event scale. So zero being like you were loved, you always felt safe, you had all your basic needs provided for, you know, you basically you had a really great childhood up to 10, which is basically you were abused as a child. You never felt safe. You didn't have autonomy over your body. You were basically like on eggshells and spun up all the time. And there is a linear association between the ACEs score and your risk of mortality, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And so, you know, a lot of these studies are difficult to disentangle because you have a lot of confounders, right? For example, people with higher ACEs scores also tend to be lower in socioeconomic. And so is it the is it the adverse childhood events or is it the socioeconomic? And the reality is it probably all matters. But when I see things like this have a dose response and also pop up very consistently across a bunch of different diseases in a bunch of different conditions on a bunch of different studies, I become relatively convinced that there is kind of a causative effect there. And and so I think one of the things that I really made a big priority is trying to manage stress. And we hear that a lot. I think it's good to say stress management rather than stress reduction necessarily. There are things you can do to reduce your stress, but you know, the idea that you're going to have a stress-free life just doesn't exist. Like there is going to be stress no matter what. And our brains are made in such a way that we're, I mean, one of the reasons human beings are still around is we are constantly standing our environment looking for threats. Only now we're not worried about getting mauled by a bearer, you know, on our day to day. So instead we perceive, well, something said, somebody said something bad about me at work. That's a threat, right? This girl didn't text me back. That's a threat. And so we start getting spun up over stuff that really, you know, we didn't have an opportunity to get stressed out about because we were too busy trying not to starve and die, you know, 10,000 years ago. And so... The weird dichotomy is as our lives have gotten easier, and there is, if you look at statistics out there, I don't care what anybody says, there is, by any objective measurement, we are living in the best time to be alive in terms of the rate of violent crime, which you wouldn't know if you watched the news all day, but it is what we're at, like, COVID kind of gave it a little bump, but our rates of violent crime, the life expectancy, the quality of life, all are basically at an all-time high, right? And what's happening. We're getting more depressed. We're getting more anxious. And, you know, so a few things real quick. The first thing is managing your stress. Now, how can you do that? Well, first thing is, I mean, as dumb as it is, exercise. That's a massive lever for managing stress. The next thing is getting outside. I'm not one of the you know, I'm not like an Andrew Huberman who I'm like stare directly at the sun for however long. But like if you go outside and go for a walk, there seems to be a stress reducing effect to that. Like you just go to a walk, listen to a podcast, listen to music, clear your mind, right? I don't even think, you know, a lot of people get big on meditation. I don't even necessarily think it's meditation in particular. I think it's more about you're just doing something that clears your mind. And so whatever that is, whether it's a walk, whether it's that for me, it's exercise. If I try to meditate, my ADHD brain actually gets more stressed because I'm like, ah, oh, I think I hear a fan clicking five miles away, you know? So whatever allows you to kind of get out of your own head for lack of a better term, me like being by the water is a big thing for me. And then other things are, who do you have in your life around you? So many times we keep relationships in our lives that we feel like we should have or that, well, you know, we, this person spins us up and stresses us out more than they actually contribute to our happiness. But for whatever reason, whether it be people pleasing or fear of rejection or whatever it is, we keep that person around. And I, man, I can tell you that like, whenever I've left a stressful relationship, whether it be romantic, business, friendship, almost immediately after I would leave that or put boundaries up. I was like, oh my God, why did I do this sooner? I feel so much better. You know, why did I have all that, all that hand wringing about doing this? And I read a book this past year called Boundaries that was actually really helpful for me. And actually what clicked in my brain was as I was reading it, I was like, oh, boundaries, I understand why they call it that. But for me, filters actually made more sense because essentially by using your boundaries and the word gets tossed around all the time, but essentially, you know, the way I interpreted it was you tell people what you need in terms of like, hey, this feels safe for me. This doesn't feel safe for me. And then you respond accordingly by either giving them access or eliminating their access to you. And so you get to let them choose whether or not they're opting in or opting out of your life. It's not your decision. It's their decision, but it's your responsibility to enforce them. And so 
People are allowed to have whatever boundaries they want. You can have, you know, really, really, you know, like if you're filtering on Google and you put a lot of different search filters in, you're going to get less and less results. Well, if you put a lot of boundaries up, you're going to have less and less people filter into your life, but you're allowed to have whatever boundaries you want. So for me, I think about, okay, what are the really important things for me to feel good in a friendship, in a romantic relationship, business relationship? And if those are not met, then I respond accordingly by limiting access to me. And sometimes people respond well where they see, oh, I did X and Y happened. And so they correct. And other people aren't. And those people get filtered out of your life. But that is a good thing because if you keep them in your life and they keep violating things that you feel very strongly about, it's going to stress you out. There's no way to get around it. And so we were talking off air beforehand. I said, you know, I think it's pretty hard to be depressed when you have really great people around you. But here's the other rub. You know, people will say, you know, we use income because it's kind of an objective measurement, right? But you will be, I think the statistic is you are typically within like on average five or 10% of the income of your five closest friends or something like that. And I think that goes both ways. Yes. If you're around really successful people, it's hard to not pick up those habits and drive, but also those people probably aren't going to let you around them if you're not displaying some of the characteristics that they value another human being. And I mean, I think you've talked about this when it comes to romantic relationships. If you want to get a better partner, be a better partner. Like if you want to get a woman who is really attractive, really successful, emotionally intelligent, you better do all those things. Because essentially, but by the way, if she's emotionally intelligent and you're on your bullshit, you're going to get... She's going to cut you out real quick because she's going to pick up on it. They're going to sniff out that insecurity and you're going to be gone. So the best thing you can do is actually to build yourself up better. And, you know, I think when it comes to friendships, romantic relationships, we like to think about unconditional love is a really nice idea. But me personally, I don't really think that exists other than your children and your parents. And even then, you can love someone and know they're not good for your life. Right. I think with our friends, especially we want unconditional love, but we also want challenge, you know, especially for us as men. It's like you got to yeah. because otherwise I, I think the unconditional love can lead to just complacency, you know, letting you get away with a whole bunch of bullshit and letting you get away with a whole bunch of stuff that you're like, <laughs> you know, it's like, why are you letting me do this? <laughs> well, I mean, I think people mistake uh, toxic positivity or especially if you're really successful, eat what is equally disruptive to your life. And I've had both are people who are nothing but critical, overcritical, because they're insecure about themselves and they want to drag you down. That's bad. Also, people who are always positive and suck up to you and are sycophants. Both of those things, equally destructive. And one of the things I tell people about uh, my best friend, we were talking about him off air, it's actually been like the best thing for my mental health to like the last few years, having him like really being really close. He tells me the truth. And he's like, he's one of the most successful people I've ever met financially and otherwise. He's very, very intelligent, very emotionally intelligent. And he tells me the truth. Like when we first started hanging out, like, and then actually now we're, uh, he's the president of one of my companies. I mean, <laughs> like every other week I'll get a text message to say, bro, take that story down. What are you doing? Like, stop being an idiot, you know? And uh, it's funny or like, you know, he had a, but he is critical about things when he feels strongly that I'm acting outside of my value system. But when I do things right, he's also the first one to give me all the credit in the world, you know? And I think that is so important to have in a good friend circle. And even as a romantic partner, uh, I can remember saying to one of my former partners, I'm like, hey, this criticism that you have of me would probably land a lot better if you also pointed out the things that I was doing right every once in a while. Like if it's just criticism, one, you, at least in my experience, for me, one of two things happens. You have to get really sensitive to it where you're perceiving everything as a, an attack or you just tune it all out because you're like, well, they're going to criticize me no matter what I do. So I'm just not even going to worry about it. And so I think finding people like that is extremely important, having good people in your life. And you get to control, if you're an adult and live on your own, you get to control who has access to you. And if you're an adult and you can't control who has access to you because you're in a bad financial situation, then that's going to take some digging out of that. I mean, there are, you know, it's kind of like choose your heart, right? Maybe that means you won't have a social life for a while because you're working two jobs or whatever it takes to get out of that. But I can promise you the juice will be worth the squeeze, you know, in the long term. So then as far as other psychological stress reduction things, I mean, therapy helps. But I will say I use therapy as basically just a tool to vent 
for the first few years. And thankfully, I have a really good therapist who I've been with for eight years. And finally, she kind of like said, hey, Lane, if you need to vent, that's fine. Like, and, and sometimes you need to do that. She goes, but if you're actually interested in getting better, we need to at some point stop venting and start focusing on the things you need to do to get better. And much like how there's like these hacks that come up in nutrition that everybody tries to hack their way around hard work, people try to hack their way around the work and therapy, which is essentially like first acknowledging your own toxic patterns and behaviors and figuring out what you're contributing to the situation because you can't control anybody else. You're only in control of yourself. I think I read something like, um, think about how hard it is to change yourself. Now imagine the futility in trying to change other people. And so figure out what you're contributing, trying to work on those aspects of you, journaling, you know, like doing that sort of stuff, doing the, the hard, boring stuff that a lot of people just don't want to do. And then the real challenge is, okay, when anybody can, when there's not a lot invested or they're calm or they're, they're regulated, that's easy. But implementing, you know, emotional regulation strategies when you are triggered, that is kind of like the peak of emotional regulation, you know? So that's been a journey for me, but I have become so much more Zen. And I'm sad to say it's because I saw how much stronger and how much better my training went when I was less stressed. And so the meathead version of me is like, well, we want to get jacked and as strong as possible. So let's be more Zen, you know? And I like, listen, I still, yeah. And I still like, and, and then I saw how that actually improved most areas of my life. And of course that was like positive reinforcement. I still have my times where I struggle with it. You know, the last couple of weeks have actually been kind of stressful for me. Kids have been out of school, home for summer. I have two neurodivergent kids. They are a challenge. They're great kids. They're awesome. I love them to death, but it is a lot of my time and challenging. And then trying to compete and then also, uh, you know, having businesses of my own. It can feel overwhelming at times. And when I feel overwhelmed and like I can't get everything done, that's where I start to spin up. But I will say I do a better job of kind of recognizing it early. I had a meeting with my team even this last week, and I thankfully I've got a really supportive team. They're going to take even more stuff off my plate, you know. And so I think most people sit in the area of one, they just look at stress as like, well, I just don't like being stressed because it's uncomfortable and don't even understand how it impacts their own lack of emotional regulation. Two, they just kind of complain. This was me. I say this as this was me. They just kind of complained about the world around them and rather than like, what can I actually do to fix the problem or to improve the problem? And so I really think if more people, you know, I think it's, and I talk about this with obesity and nutrition and, and health, but it applies across the board. I think it's very tempting and it feels good for the ego to find an outside source to blame for our problems. That feels good, but over the long term, it doesn't because you feel disempowered. You feel really disempowered. And I just see this now with it being election season of everybody doing this. And I, you know what? People, some people don't like him, but I, I really like this quote, Dave Ramsey. He said, if some of you worried about what went on in your house, as much as you worried about what went on in the White House, your lives would be exponentially better. And, you know, there's all these people in the comments going, well, that speaks from a place of privilege. No, no, it speaks from a place of practicality. Because guess how much control you have over what happens in the national legislation? You have this much, you have that much. You have your vote, and then if you want to you know, be part of an organization who tries to change things, fine. But you have very little control over that. But you have a lot of control over what goes on in your house. And so I think at age 42, I finally learned the lesson of, you know, maybe not everything's my fault, but it's going to be my responsibility to try and figure out strategies to manage this. Because if I'm looking for somebody else to come save me, I mean, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back up the chain of what you're talking about. And I think you just laid out some really important pieces and strategies. I want to touch on the boundaries as a filter. I love that because we often talk about how, you know, that you have porous boundaries, which is you know, to go with that filter analogy that the openings are there. There's kind of like no real filter in place. And then you have rigid boundaries, uh, which are much stronger filters. And generally speaking, my wife had this great saying, she's a couples therapist. She said, boundaries teach other people 
people how to treat us, you know? And so when we don't have those boundaries, there's no filters. And so people can kind of treat us however we want. Yep. And then when we have hyper rigid boundaries, people can't get through and we are often lonely and disconnected because, you know, we're in a silo. We've kind of caged ourselves off. So I love that notion of having healthy boundaries because it's a filter system of connection, you know, of how you actually build relationship with other people. But I do want to come back up the chain. I think one of the things that maybe we kind of missed uh, getting into is like, what's the actual impact of stress on the body? We obviously talked about it not being great, but what it, what's actually happening? What's the system of stress? You know, when you are stressed, what does it deploy? I think it'd be good for us to touch on that. Yeah. And honestly, I don't think they've elucidated all the mechanisms yet. You know, I think that there is really some undefined mechanisms that probably explain some of this. Like everybody kind of wants to point to cortisol, which is definitely part of it. You know, if you're spun up all the time, you're going to have higher levels of catecholamines, you're going to have higher levels of cortisol. One of the problems is not like getting into biochemistry because my background's in biochemistry. People will say things like, this hormone is bad, this system is bad, no, 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 no. Your body did not evolve to put something in place that was just there to hurt you. Like that is not why things evolve. That, that shows a fundamental lack of understanding of physiology and quite frankly, evolutionary science. Now, there are some pathways that when they are dysregulated, they don't do us any favors, but that applies to almost any pathway that's dysregulated. And so let's take cortisol. If you secrete too much, it's called Cushing's disease. Bad. You secrete too little, it's Addison's disease. Also bad. Now, there's some evidence that like where you aren't over secreting to the point of Cushing's, but basically your basal levels of cortisol are, are up, you know, and that this ties into kind of like inflammation, possibly and the immune system. And we do see this actually a lot of autoimmune disorders have a very close tie to stress. And so, you know, our catecholamines, our, you know, kind of fight or flight sympathetic response, it is there for a reason, because when you need to press the gas pedal, you need that gas gas pedal to be ready to go. Like you need to be able to drop it into passing gear and crush, right? Like that's very important. The problem is some people are walking around with the pedal mashed down when they have no idea even why, right? And so I guess we can use a car analogy. You know, if you're, there's a reason that NASCAR drivers or IndyCar drivers don't have the pedal mashed down all the time, right? Like they know when to pick their spots, when to mash it and when to kind of like yeah. not cruise, but you, I think you know what I mean. Like, like sit Sit and wait for their opportunity, right? And so, like, I'm actually thinking of a great scene from uh, Days of Thunder. Do you remember Days <laughs> of Thunder? Do, yeah. Did you ever see that yeah, one? Yeah. So, there's a scene where the coach, uh, Robert Duvall, basically is like, you know, you're trying to race these things like Indy cars and they're not Indy cars. Like, you got to manage how you're doing it, but I'm going to butcher the actual lines. And then, you know, he has him do it his way, Tom Cruise do it his way, then he has it do it the coach's way and shows the tires afterwards. And, you know, the driver's way, the tires are all chewed up and everything at, at the end, his tires look okay. And he goes, by the way, I was eight seconds faster. Right? So I think for a lot of us, when we activate this sympathetic nervous system response, if we're not shutting it down and actually, interestingly, there's a lot of things in biology that kind of follow this pattern where, you know, a, an acute activation of something is fine not associated with disease, but then a chronic activation of the system at a low level is associated with disease. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. Connor, if I told you I was going to have you do something that raised your cortisol, raised your inflammation, raised your free radicals, raised your heart rate, raised your blood pressure, what would you say? Ooh, I'd probably say, I don't know if that's a good idea for too long, but maybe in a short burst, it's probably mm -hmm. okay for my system. Right. Because that's yeah. what that's what exercise does. Exercise does all that stuff, right? And we call this effect kind of like hormesis, like you give a controlled dose of a stress, you can handle it. We also see it with, you know, rises in blood glucose. So after a meal, blood glucose goes up, insulin goes up, and it comes, if you're healthy, it comes back down. It's a truncated response and that signaling goes back to normal. And despite what the CGM wearing keto warriors will tell you, a short term rises and falls in glucose as a normal part of physiology is not associated with disease and not a problem. And the same thing with, you know, and I always tell them, hey, if you want to like make that a problem, then 
You got to make exercise a problem because look at what happens in the short term. You also got to make protein a problem because protein activates mTOR, which mTOR is overactive in a lot of cancers. Okay. But again, it is a short truncated activation where it goes back to baseline. And then with fats, uh, fats impede flow mediated dilation after a meal, which flow mediated dilation is associated with cardiovascular disease. So again, we see all these systems that if something happens in the short term, it's not predictive of long-term negative effects. And so same thing with paras- with sympathetic activation, right? Like you're doing a hard workout, your catecholamines get going, your court, by the way, your cortisol goes up during a hard workout, all these things, inflammation goes up, but it doesn't negatively affect you long-term. But if we're chronically activating those systems long-term, who knows what the downstream ramifications of those. And I think, you know, I am going out on a limb here. There may be data to support it. I don't know if there is, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think when you do that, your body is feeling a threat. So it's fighting back. And I think it starts attacking you. I think at a certain point you start attacking you. And I think that could possibly explain why you see high levels of psychological stress associated with a lot of autoimmune disease, uh, you know, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, all that stuff. Is it the case, I'm just going to give a basic analogy because I think, and I'm not a scientist. And so I'm, I'm going to use the analogy as a way for me to like really comprehend what's happening and you alter it and fix it or, you know, say it's garbage, um, whatever, however it lands. From my understanding, when we are more stressed, we move more into a sympathetic dominant state in our nervous system which then has a chain reaction of the neurochemicals that get released, things like cortisol, et cetera. And the more that we have that going on in the body, the more that we're in an inflammatory state. And then if you are in that inflammatory state for a long period of time, it's that inflammatory state that's stressful. So it's almost like if you put a brick on the gas pedal of a car and you rev the engine higher than it would normally run in a sort of natural homeostasis, over time, that's going to cause wear and tear on the engine. Is that a credible analogy or what would you alter about what I just laid out? It might be. You know, inflammation is very poorly understood by the general public and even some scientists. So inflammation is basically part of your immune system, right? So that's part of what your body uses to fight disease. So when people say, oh, inflammation is bad, eh, too much inflammation chronically is bad, but you would not want to live a life with zero right, inflammation. Right. That is not a good yeah. thing. It means you're dead. <laughs> so I think, and a lot of people also misunderstand inflammation. They think, oh, I have joint pain. Uh, I have back pain. My tummy hurts. That is localized inflammation in response to some sort of, whether it's an acute, we'll call it an insult, not necessarily injury. But what we're referring to is systemic inflammation, which is basically measured by cytokine kinds secreted by the liver, such as CRP, uh, IL-6, IL-1, IL-10. Now, here's the thing about inflammation that's really tricky. I took a six-month course on immunology in graduate school, and I walked out going, we have no idea what any of this stuff means. Like, This thing is inflammatory, but also as soon as it's secreted, it also starts an anti-inflammatory cascade to shut its own cascade down. And this thing we think is inflammatory, but only when these other markers are present. But when this marker is present, it's actually anti-inflammatory. So it is a be very wary of people who speak in like absolutes about inflammation and overgeneralize because it is very complicated. That being said, I don't know if the activation of the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase inflammation inflammation chronically. I'm not super Mm. sure about that. But what I will say is I think we're finding now that there may be subclinical elevations in, you know, cortisol or inflammation markers or, you know, some of these things that while you wouldn't consider it excess, perhaps over time it has a negative effect, right? So yeah, all that to say, I don't know, but I think there probably is something to the story of, you know, the idea that when you are kind of pushing this sympathetic system all the time that your body is looking for something to attack and maybe it starts attacking you, right? Yeah, because I think about, you know, what you were talking about before with the ACEs test and, you know, how much trauma somebody has experienced, abuse, neglect, etc. I mean, I, I work a lot with people who have experienced adverse experiences in their childhood, you know, whether it's sexual abuse or physical abuse or neglect or abandonment or whatever it is. And sometimes it's not super extreme acute things. Sometimes it's an ongoing thing. But in many ways, when they're having a trauma response or they're shutting down or they're moving into a rage response, it's an 
extreme, you know, I think Besser van der Koch in The Body Keeps the Score did some good research on this. And, and it's sort of an extreme response of you're moving into this, you know, the extreme version of it is a dorsal vega response where your body is literally uh, shutting the systems down, right? It's like telling your brain to shut down uh, within the body and disconnect from the overwhelm of emotional sensation and physical sensation. But there is a huge spike in things like cortisol. And so if you're somebody that's dealing with chronic anxiety or PTSD or ongoing, you know, uh, sort of ongoing trauma responses where your threat detection system is on all the time and your threat detection system is active in a way that is abnormal, my guess, and this is a complete guess, but my guess is that if your threat detection system is on all the time, you probably have more cortisol in your system than is probably good for your system just as a general piece. Is that? Yeah, it may be. And then also, just like you said, like, you know, our bodies and our sympathetic, you know, this is all electrical signals and chemicals and synapses and whatnot. And, you know, pressing again, pressing on that gas pedal when it's supposed to be used kind of like in, you know, short bursts, probably not great. And again, like if you're spun up all the time, like, you will have fatigue. You will feel tired. You feel it in your body. One of the things I really liked, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. John Deloney. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And when listening to his podcast, I actually never really thought about it this way, but he would always talk about anxiety and depression and like trauma as how someone feels it in their body. And I never really thought about it that way until I listened to his show. And then I realized, oh, wow, he's absolutely right. You do feel it in your body. And I mean, what you were saying about like shutting down. I never even realized it till I went to therapy. That was my go-to. Like when I was stressed, especially in a romantic relationship, I couldn't even recall general, like my therapist would be like, okay, so tell me about the argument. And I would just go blank. Cause I'm like, I don't remember it at all. Like I remember how it started, but then there'd be a certain point where it was like, I just shut down. And that, you know, turns out that's a protective mechanism to, you know, stop the overwhelm and the flooding of, you know, those, but it's not helpful. It's, you know, stonewalling, kind of non-purposeful stonewalling. And so one of the things we worked on in therapy was me staying more mindful during conflict and, you know, actually trying to listen to what was being said and try to detach, you know, the catastrophizing of, of the situation. And yeah, it's just so crazy how, and they do show this is why relying on people's recollection of events under stress is like just, it's an absolute crapshoot, you know? And that's why people have such different starkly different recollections of the same event because again, you are diverting everything to fight or flight. Our higher processing centers that deal with memory formation and whatnot, that's like, it's like, you know, in Star Trek where you go, divert all power to shields, right? Like, that's it. That's what it, that's what your body's doing essentially. It's it's like we have so much resources and we're sending it all the shields right now, right? So I definitely, you know, even though the the mechanisms haven't been fully flushed out, I definitely think there is something to, you know, being in that constant state of threat and the ramifications it has. And, you know, I, I love the phrase, the body keeps score. In my own personal anecdote and based on some of the scientific liter literature I've read, I think there's something to that. You see it too with like your classical people who are like, rub dirt on it. Don't be a wuss. You're a man. Don't cry. And then 20 years later, this person is blowing up over the dishes, right? Like, and it's like, cause you never, you never processed the thing you needed to process, you know, and then there's over processing of things as well. You know, people who want to deal with it in opportune time, in an opportune moment, you know, neither of those two things are good, but yeah, like if you don't deal if you choose not to deal with your problems, your problems will deal with you. That's such a good phrase. And I think, you know, in some ways we have created this culture where like th th those polarities seem to be pretty strong, right? It's like overprocess, the sh living shit out of everything or, you know, stuff it down. I'm curious to follow this through line of stress and, and start to enter into this conversation about testosterone. What's what is what does the data show about the impact that stress can have on testosterone? And I know this is a big thing for a lot of guys because they see the headlines of testosterone rates are dropping and, you know, there's all the scare around sperm, you know, sperm counts are just plummeting and men are going to be infertile in however many years. So I'm, I'm curious to get your take on what's the, what's the impact that stress has on our ability to produce testosterone. And if our testosterone drops significantly, what starts to happen physically and mentally for us? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I haven't really looked at the data really closely, but 
based on some preliminary results, it does appear that there is kind of a, a threshold effect in men where essentially like if you get to a certain level of stress, your testosterone starts to decline. And I've seen kind of like actually how we got talking was I think there was a comment I left and I, I can't remember what it was. It might've been microplastics. Micro, um, yeah, it was. It was, it was yeah, like microplastics so, are in your balls now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, which, which I mean, like, so I kind of always go back to Two things can be true, right? Now, here's the issue with data. So there is, you know, we have seen an increase in microplastics. Testosterone has been dropping, right? And I'm not sure if it's due to the microplastics, to be quite frank. I'm not saying it's a good thing. And people are like, well, how do you explain the decline in testosterone over the last, what is it, 70 years? And I'm like, uh, something else happened in the last 70 years too. People started getting fatter. And if you look at, I actually have a study pulled up right here for every one point increase in BMI, it's associated with a 2.2% decrease in testosterone and men with a BMI of 35 to 40. So obesity had 50% lower levels of testosterone compared to lean men. So you don't really need to look much further than that, right? And also, if we look at microplastics, probably also a proxy for poor diet quality, to be honest. You know, if you're eating mostly like whole single source food supply, I mean, you might, there might still be some microplastics because they're probably relatively pervasive in the food supply, but you're probably getting a lot less of them than you are with, you know, kind of junk food and whatnot. And so again, I, I just worry about this and I worry about some of the rhetoric in the male community as well, because even though like even some of these like, I guess more red pill side of things where it's like, you know, you're a man, be a man, you know, whatever. Um, which by the way, I think again, like both things can be true. There can be some truth to some of those messages while also overall it being garbage. And so, you that know, was, it's like was, when one person tells 10 lies, <laughs> yeah, one person tells 10 lies in a, in a single truth, people go, Oh, see, we can trust to be told one truth. I'm like, uh, no, that's not how that works. Uh, each statement needs to be evaluated on its own merit. And, but even those accounts that would kind of be like, tell you like, oh, it's a pick yourself up by the bootstraps. You're in control of your destiny. Even they really do the whole, you know, the government is trying to make you sick and the food companies and big pharma and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Nobody put the cookies in your mouth. You put the cookies in there. Big food didn't make you eat the cookies. And I'm sorry, like this whole food addiction thing. Now there are, just because something is pleasurable to do does not mean it is an addiction, okay? Now, there are things that can be very difficult to stop, okay? And there is what's called a food dependence where basically you've associated eating food with kind of a tool to manage stress. That can be very difficult to stop, but like a lot of people talk about sugar addiction. And honestly, like nobody's eating bags of raw sucrose. It's not sugar. What tends to be like fall in the food dependence category is foods that are high in sugar, high in fat, highly processed, have uh, a certain texture and mouthfeel. All that stuff plays into palatability. And so, yes, that stuff is true, okay? You also have a responsibility to make decisions for yourself, okay? And listen, my brother was addicted to crystal meth, okay? An actually physically addictive drug that kills people and destroys lives. And my brother just stopped one day. And he said, you know, he's like, I, I know I'm only one person. He's like, but all I know is... I just decided that I wasn't going to do this stuff anymore. And it was really, really hard. But I also know that to keep doing it was going to make my life infinitely harder. And uh, actually, he had, a, he had a great line without even realizing it. He went to jail for like, I want to say 18 months at one point for manufacturing. And I asked him, I was like, you know, was that rock bottom? Was that what turned it around for you? And he goes, no. He goes, I got out of jail and I was still kind of on the same path. He goes, but one day I just woke up and I realized that I lose everything. I get some money and I lose it. I get a relationship and I lose it. I get a job and I lose it. I just got sick and tired of losing. And if you talk to people who like lost a lot of weight, they got off drugs, they got off alcohol. Yes, some of them required, you know, more support than others. And I, and again, I'm, I'm all for people getting the support they need, but it started with a decision. You cannot, anybody who's ever dealt with an addict of any shape and form knows you cannot talk them into stopping addiction. You cannot just send them literature on what addiction does. You cannot just lay out the facts because it's this isn't a math problem. It's not a logic problem. If we were doing logic, we never would have gotten on drugs in the first place, right? It's like when, um, again, I'm going to use a Dave Ramsey quote because his kind of thing is, we'll pay off the smallest debt first, regardless of interest rate, and then the next debt and so on and so forth. And people 
all the time. They'll go, well, that's dumb. Pay off the one with the highest interest rate. And he goes, yes, if we were doing math, that would make sense. But if we were doing math, we wouldn't be $100,000 in credit card debt. So we're just going to set the math to the side and realize that this is a behavior problem, right? And so I think some of the damaging messaging that's out there is the whole, the government wants you to be sick or they, the like the nefarious they that never gets defined like Illuminati or whatever. And the problem with using that is everyone gets accused of being part of they at some point. Like I've accused of being paid off by big pharma, by big food, big meat, big vegetable. I like, <laughs> like just name whatever. Right. And I'm like, no, yeah. And I'm like, no, I just read the data. Like I'm just conveying to you what the data says and don't shoot the messenger, you know? And then it's invariably like when the scientific research doesn't support whatever their belief system or bias is and they go, well, you know, we can't trust scientific research because, you know, it's all bought and paid for. Okay, so I want to shoot this thing right in the face right now. Are there studies that get fabricated? Is there bad scientific research that is unduly influenced by money? Absolutely. And the great thing about science is it is self-correcting. And that is why good scientists don't go crazy over a single study. They wait until there's quite a few studies. And hey, maybe we'll be wrong. We might discuss a study, but we'll try to put a good scientist, we'll put it in context with how it fits with the rest of the data. And like, we'll change our minds if we if enough data gets presented to us. And so what I always tell people is like, yes, you know, this is kind of the unicorn fallacy. Just because scientific research is flawed, we don't need to throw the whole thing out. Because you know what's more flawed? Our own beliefs and experiences and our own observations, okay? Because there's a lot more bias in that than there is in scientific research. If you think there's bias in scientific research, God, where do you find out about your own personal bias? Like we just talked about how two people can watch the same event and have drastically different interpretations of the same event. And so you're wanting to rely on feelings? to discuss what we should be discussing science-wise. I'm sorry, when I'm getting cardiovascular, when I'm getting a bypass or something like that, I don't want a cardio surgeon who like did his whole thing based on feelings. You know, he was like, well, you know, I just felt like this kind of bypass would be bad. No, I want somebody who combed through the evidence, who went through a ton of med school, a ton of training, and basically had it beaten into them, the scientific method. Like I don't want to chance it on feelings, right? And so, yes, scientific research is flawed for sure. But it is still a better system than just freaking winging it. You know what I mean? And um, so I think that this is a big danger in the, some of these arguments about, you know, the, the government wanting to make you sick or this entity or whatever. Like, hey, there are things that are within your control that you can do. And guess what? For all that, the problem is when you make a more extreme hypothesis, the conditions to prove it also become more extreme, right? So when you say food or, you know, things with sugar in them are addictive, okay, well, then how do you explain tribes that eat a lot of honey and aren't obese and food addict? Well, 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 well that's natural sugar. Okay, well, then biochemically, these things are the same. Like, they're, they're, like they're the same. Like when you get down to the molecules, they're the same. So please explain to me how one molecule is interacting differently with those receptors than another molecule, because you probably can't do it. Okay. And so again, hard, difficult is not the same thing as impossible. And just like people who say, well, you, you know, you can't lose fat if you're eating carbs, it's going to keep your insulin high. Uh, I don't know how many millions of examples we need of people who ate low fat, high carb diets who actually did lose weight to show that that is obviously not true. Okay. I mean, it goes for multiple sides too. You got other people like, well, you know, you're not going to be metabolically healthy, healthy if you're eating a low carb diet. No, there are people who definitely get metabolically healthy eating low carb diets. Like these things are very nuanced and a lot of con context is required. But what is com a complete waste of freaking time is worrying about shit that you have no control over. What you can control, right? And this is um, one of the things that I always tell myself when I start feeling down is I am in control. I I'm in control over my thoughts and I'm in the con control over my actions. I control what goes in my mouth because also, guess what? Yeah, well, this is so funny. I, I like the phrase, like everyone is socialist with everybody else's money and libertarian with their own. It's kind of like with, with bodies as well. If somebody loses weight, they don't want to like credit the food industry or the government or like they're going to credit themselves, right? But when they get, when they will gain too much weight, it's, it's very rarely, you know, yeah, I just ate too much. You know, it's my bad. I should have better habits or whatever. No, they want to blame everybody else. And again, are you familiar with Ethan Suplee? 
No, I'm not, no. Okay, so Ethan is a Hollywood actor. He was uh, he was basically known for being a really obese guy in movies. He was in Remember the Titans. He was in My oh, Name is yeah, Earl. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm I know sure you is, know the yeah. actor. Yeah. Now he's like 220 pounds and jacked, all right? Yeah. And he had a phrase he, he'd always put up on his Instagram whenever he'd post a picture of him doing a workout. And he would say, I killed my clone today. And I texted him one time and I'm like, are you saying basically that like you just – kind of like developed a new identity of who you were. He goes, that's exactly what I'm saying. He goes, cause that person is still inside of me and I have to defeat him every day. And it takes being mindful and it takes intentionality. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me is like, you know, yesterday, I think I was actually on his podcast when he said this. He said, yesterday I did a ruck with a 50 pound rucksack and it was really hard. It was an hour and a half. It was really hard. And a lot of obese people will probably think, wow, it's so hard to exercise. He's like, all I can tell you is I realized that rucksack, I used to walk around with six of them 24 hours a day. And no matter how hard, and no matter how hard it is for me to exercise and make better habits about what I put in my mouth, it is infinitely easier than living being 500 pounds. It is infinitely easier than that. And there was a It was a motivational video I was watching that had a clip from Robert Downey Jr. on Oprah years ago after he had just kind of gotten through his drug addiction. And it really stood out to me. And he said, you know, it is not that difficult to get past some of these seemingly ghastly problems. And Oprah like was flabbergasted. And she goes, wait, you're saying it's not difficult? Like to somebody who had struggled for years with drug addiction. He goes, no, what's hardest to decide. And I thought about that and I realized most of us say we want our lives to change, but we don't want to change ourselves. We want to have a new life, a better life while we drag our crappy habits and behaviors behind ourselves. And you see this with people who go through new romantic partners all the time. Just like as soon as conflict comes up, like, well, you're gone because, you know, somebody... It can't possibly be me. It must be everybody else, right? Or they go through diet fads or they keep trying all the, they keep going through jobs or whatever it is. And one of my favorite phrases that I heard on John Deloney's show was, before you quit that job, before you move cities, before you break up with your partner, remember, you go with you. And I thought that was so powerful. So essentially all that to tie back in, it starts in here and here with intentionality and a decision that you're going to do things differently. And that's really hard. That's really hard to make that decision. It's really hard. And I think Eric Thomas said, when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, that's when we'll change. And I will say, I'll amend that quote. When we realize that the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, that's when we change. Because think about Ethan's case, if you could take somebody who was in a 500 pound body and put them in Ethan's body now, or if you take 550 pound Ethan Suplee, you put him in 220 pound Ethan Suplee's body for a day. He feels what that feels like, what he's able to do, the life he has. All of a sudden, it no longer is a question about, is this worth the cost? It is absolutely worth the cost. And I think a lot of us struggle with We'll put in the work if we know there's a guaranteed outcome. A lot of us will, you know, if there's, this is why entrepreneurship show hard, right? Like we go to a job, we know we're going to get a paycheck at the end of two weeks or four weeks or whatever it is. And so we'll put in the work. It's really hard to put in the work without a guaranteed outcome. That's why top level athletes, it's so hard to get there because you're going to do all this work and there, you might do everything right. And there's a chance that you won't get it. And so, but what I'll tell people is if you don't put in the work, you absolutely won't get it. And If you put in the work, even if you don't get whatever your dream is, like take athletics, me trying to be a world powerlifting champion, whatever, you will learn lessons and gain character along the way from walking that path that will benefit you in other aspects of your life. And I think that's often so missed by people. Couldn't agree more. I think I want to come back up the chain and then move on from the testosterone thing. But I think one of the things that you're really saying is being overweight, having a high BMI is certainly not helpful for testosterone. How you approach it, you know, I think is very helpful. If, if you are a, and maybe you don't have like a, like a specific answer to this. Um, and if not, that's okay. We'll, we'll move to a, a different area. But if you're a guy, so obviously if you're a guy that's like, you look in the mirror and you're like, okay, I'm definitely, I could use you know, I could use losing a few pounds. It's going to help my testosterone. But if you're a guy that's in decent shape, your testosterone is still a little bit low. Are there things you can do like certain exercises, certain foods that are going to support your increase in testosterone? If that's something that you've gone and had it tested and it's, you know, it's a little subpar, where should people start? So 
first of all, what I tell people is if you're worried about your testosterone, just actually go to get it checked. I can't tell you how many guys are like, I need TRT. And I'm like, have you actually had it checked? Oh, no, you haven't. Okay, well, then you don't know if you need TRT. Okay, you're just basically one excuse to hop on the sauce because you don't want to fix this other stuff. All right. And then it's like, okay, your testosterone's 400 or 350, which it's, you know, not clinically low, but you might like have some, have low libido or low energy. Okay. Is it low energy and low libido because your testosterone's low or is it because you sleep four hours a night, sit in the couch and watch TV all day, don't exercise and have bad stress management and work a job you hate? Oh, gee, I wonder which one. Right. And so I think I look at this as like different levers to pull. Like what is the biggest lever we can pull to get the most benefit? As we discussed, if you're overweight or obese, getting to a normal healthy body weight is going to be the biggest lever you can pull. Okay. Now, is it possible that, you know, if your testosterone is clinically low, that doing a testosterone replacement may help you feel better so that you get moving more and that could facilitate better luck? Yeah, that's possible. I, I can see a, a scenario for that. But I think you know, again, like blaming everything on testosterone or the decrease in testosterone. Listen, we didn't like, we didn't suddenly in the last 70 years, our genetics changed so much that we just stopped secreting less testosterone, right? Like our environment changed and, and we just got quite frankly, kind of fat and not very active. I won't say lazy. I won't say lazy because that's more of a psychological aspect of things. But, you know, like we saw in that depression study, the best thing you can do is get moving. And here's a real kicker for this behavior stuff that I think is important to point out. Stop waiting for it to feel good. It is not going to feel good. If you only do things that feel good, your life will be really, really hard. Sometimes, in fact, most times, most of the things that are going to be good for us in the long term don't feel good in the short term. You know, it feels much better to play video games and watch Netflix than read a book to upskill. It feels much better to watch Netflix and play video games than to go outside and go for a walk or go for a training session or whatever. And that is the greatest dichotomy in life is whatever makes it easier in the short term will make it harder in the long term. And what makes it harder in the short term improves your life in the long term. You can go down almost any list of like, even right down to like, oh, you, you know, I'm not going to do that hard conversation because I just don't want to deal with the, the conflict or whatever. Okay. Conflict delayed is conflict amplified. Just going to be worse in six months, right? And so you can apply that to almost any aspect of life. So testosterone specifically, you know, maintaining a normal or lean or lean body weight. By the way, it also goes the other way. If you go, if you get too lean, like super shredded, your testosterone can drop as well. In fact, in every case study of natural bodybuilders who are drug free, who can, who compete by the time the male for males, by the time they're like competition lead, they're hypogonadal. Like it, and I experienced this as well when I competed in natural bodybuilding. Like I'm somebody who like my natural testosterone when it's measured is anywhere between 800 and like 1100. And and usually have pretty good energy, pretty healthy sex drive, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, when I'm like ready for competition, yeah, sex is the last thing on my mind. I have very low energy, you know, all that kind of stuff. But again, it's a lifestyle thing. I got too lean, right? So there's this kind of sweet spot for testosterone, probably between, I mean, it's probably individually dependent what body fat percentage it is. It's probably somewhere between like, you know, 10 to 20% body fat is where, you know, testosterone is kind of in its sweet spot. So you know, if you're, if you're 30, 40% body fat, yeah, you're going to have low testosterone. And if you lose that body fat, your testosterone will come up. And also if you exercise, your testosterone will come up. If you get more sleep, your testosterone will come up. So, you know, if you're sleeping four hours a night and you're stressed out all the time and you don't exercise and you're poo-pooing about your low testosterone, sorry, buddy, there's uh, a lot of stuff that's actually within your control that you aren't doing that would improve your testosterone. Uh, and those are some of the things I mentioned are the biggest levers, right? And again, I am not against, I have never taken TRT and can't because of the organization I compete in, but I'm not against people getting TRT if they have low testosterone. All I'm saying is if you don't address the likely root cause, what you are doing is you are band-aiding over a wound that is going to continue to bleed, even though you might slow it down for a little bit, because this stuff is going to be pervasive in other areas of your life. As far as food goes, I mean, if you're, there's some evidence that like, you know, minimally processed food is associated with, you know, not as low. I don't think it's anything about the processing itself. I think what it is, is ultra processed foods are way easy to overeat. There's a study out there by Kevin Hall at NIH, where he switched people from a minimally processed diet to an ultra processed diet and they spontaneously increase their food intake by 500 calories a day. Boom, there you go. That explains the obesity crisis, low testosterone, all that stuff. It's not that ultra processed food has some weird chemicals in it that disrupt hormones, all that kind of stuff. 
No, it's really freaking tasty. You eat too much of it and you get more body fat and that lowers your testosterone. This is what we like to call in science Occam's razor, which is when all things are equal, the simplest explanation is usually true. And so, but people don't like to hear that because there's that whole personal responsibility aspect there. They want to hear it's some, you know, some food chemical or microplastics or whatever it is because... That is, well, you know, I didn't have any control over that. And that's why, okay, well, guess what? If you don't have control over that, then you can't fix it. You can't change it. And so that's actually disempowering. And so instead of looking at personal responsibility as a threatening attack, look at it as I'm, I have some control and I can change things. And that was what, again, even though I was very regimented with my nutrition and training, my therapist, she said to me one day, she's like, Lane, you realize that if all the, the story you're telling yourself is true, you actually, if you don't have responsibility in these things, then you also can't fix it. And I just want to empower you that you do have power to change some of these things and improve your life. And she made that exact relation that I just made to exercise and fitness because that always came easy to me, but it doesn't to a lot of people, obviously. And so I realized, oh my God, she's right. And then, you know, I've slowly started to make changes and hey, my life now is immeasurably better than it was two, three, four, five years ago. Like I, I can't even, I can't even explain, like my stressors now are, I have too many opportunities essentially and I'm busy. <laughs> like that's my stressors, you know? <laughs> I'm going to shift gears because we're running short on time. And as I predicted, I probably could talk to you for five hours and ask oh, you a shit sure. ton of questions. And I would have so much fun doing that. Uh, so we might have to have round two. Yeah, because we'll schedule there's a bunch, round two. There's just a bunch of stuff that we didn't get to that I'm like, we're not going to get to. But what I would like to touch on is just a few sort of like tactical, practical things. So I'm going to hit you up with not rapid fire because I hate that when I'm on shows. And I'm like, I'm going to give you 20 rapid fire questions. Um, so answer these as you please. But how tactical, practical, how would you recommend somebody go about increasing or improving their bench, their squat and their deadlift? Do the lifts. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, if we look at like, so tactical, you need to progressively overload, which means you need to increase load on the bar or number of reps or number of hard sets that you're doing. Practical consistency is king, right? And staying low pain, low injury risk is king. And so a lot of that boils down to also understanding the concept of auto-regulation, which is basically like how I train. So for example, tactical in terms of strength uh, seems to be a little bit different than hypertrophy. They obviously are very related. If you grow muscle, you all, all things being equal, you get stronger. But the way in which you grow muscle might matter. So training to failure, for example, if you train to failure versus train to like a rep or two shy of failure, appears to have real no difference on hypertrophy. They both will grow muscle. But on strength, particularly, it actually appears that training to failure is counterproductive for maximal strength because you accumulate so much uh, fatigue that one – you can't do as much total work. So like, for example, let's say your, your max reps you can do on bench presses, uh, 200 pounds for 10 reps, right? You do, you do a set of 10 and that's absolutely, you could not have done one more. You grind it out that last rep. How many reps are you going to get on another set with 200? Five or six, you know? Then if you do another one, maybe you're getting like three or four, like the cliff is going to be pretty significant. Whereas, Hey, you could have done like sets of eight, stopped a couple reps shy, gotten more sets in, more total work, more hard sets before you went to total fatigue, right? And oh, by the way, you could go to failure on the last set if you really like to go to failure, right? But again, training to failure, at least on compound lifts like that, has been shown to be somewhat counterproductive for strength. So tactically, you know, doing probably, and again, I'm going to overgeneralize a lot of people will say, well, you've got to be completely recovered before your next session or, you know, if you train too frequently. But listen, more frequency and more volume. I'm not aware of many things in life where you do less and get more. OK, for the most part. Now, again, if you're new to training, you're going to gain strength and muscle just doing a few sets a week. You don't need to do a bunch of sets like you probably want to go with like the minimum effective dose, because eventually where I'm at now is the dosage of training I need to make progress is right up against against what is going to overtrain me and get me hurt. Okay. So you don't need to jump right up to that, right? You want to kind of slowly walk things up over time. And that's part of progressive overload. And so 
but I, I always tell people a quote that I got from one of my powerlifting coaches about 10 years ago. His name was Mike Zordos. He's a professor at FAU who studies strength and conditioning training. And he said, here's all I need to tell you to dispel the whole, you know, volume doesn't work, which is if I kidnapped your family and the ransom was you need to add 50 pounds to your squat in 12 weeks, would you squat once a week? The hell you would, right? You'd be squatting like as much as you could possibly tolerate, right? So practice helps, like just the neural, if we're talking about one rep max strength, practice helps establishing like form and technique and being most efficient. Two, doing heavy sets with low reps will make you stronger, absolutely, comparing to doing the same number of hard sets with higher reps because it's more specific to the skill. And then I would say in general, probably training those lifts two to three times a week, whatever your recovery capacity at the time can handle for, you you know, several hard sets, but probably stopping shy of failure is probably your, your best bet. But again, compliance is the science. And like, you know, I tell people, if you hate training low reps and you're not going to work hard at it, but you like doing sets of 10, then you probably should be doing sets of 10. Because if you hate low reps and you're not going to, you know, work hard at it, then you're not going to get a strong. I had a client one time who asked me, they're like, you know, I love doing CrossFit. I hate bodybuilding workouts, but I want to grow more muscle. I know CrossFit isn't the best thing. And I'm like, well, it might be the best thing for you because if I give you a bodybuilding program that you hate, you go in and just like ho-hum your way through it. Whereas in CrossFit, if you're like going hard and pushing hard, you probably will grow more muscle that way. So that's where tactical and practical have to meet. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I kind of gone on this journey a little bit. Like my mission was to get into the best physical shape of my life by 40 last year. And that definitely happened. I think my body is, and I think I know my body is in the best shape of my life that it's ever been in. And I got to this place where I wanted to put on a little bit more size. So I'm like 6'1", 195. And I wanted to, you know, just see what was possible in terms of bulking and, you know, maybe get to like 205, 210. And what I found was a couple of things. One, I did G I did German volume training, which was intense. <laughs> it was it was intense, and I definitely started to bulk. But I I noticed that it was it was pretty strenuous on my body because I wasn't doing one week on one week off. I was doing like every single week I was doing GVT, and you know after a month and a half, two months, that I was like, man, my joints are fucking sore. And like you know after especially after like leg days, you know the, the next day I was just it was just brutal. And the the gains were slow, but they were there and. But, but what I've noticed is I have a sort of um, like a more like lean body structure and lean muscle mass. Like like I'm just more naturally lean. So for guys that are more lean in nature, because I think that some guys have a maybe an easier time, maybe not putting on putting on mass, putting on that type of volume. What do you generally recommend? Is it just about that progressive overload that you're talking about, like incrementally moving up in weight, and that will just naturally help you bulk? Um, what are some of the other tips that you would give to guys like me that that have problems with putting on a lot? Lot more mass. Yeah. So there's a few things here. There's the, the energy component, which to put on mass, you need to eat more food, like mass in, mass out, or energy in, energy out. Uh, I'll go, I'll come back to that. I will say, so, you know, if I was advising you, I'd be like, Hey, before we jump into German volume training, why don't we progressively walk up your number of sets? Because actually, if you look at the risk of pain injury, one of the biggest predictors are large jumps in volume and training intensity. So just like training any skill, you can train yourself to recover better. Like if you're used to, for example, if you only do a body part once a week, a lot of times that body part will be sore for about a week. And I remember the first time I ever started training legs twice a week, I'm like, I can't do that. My legs are sore for a week. But what I found is like over time, my legs got less and less sore because I was training them to recover faster, right? And I even got to the point where I think at my peak, before I started really dealing with a lot of pain and injury, I was squatting like three, four times a week, benching four times a week, deadlifting two, three times a week. Like I was an absolute freaking beast. I can't tolerate that kind of training volume anymore because my, my lifestyle doesn't accommodate that. I'm not just working my entire lifestyle around training, unfortunately. But you can walk up what you can tolerate. And so what I'll tell people is like, don't jump straight into that high volume stuff. You might be able to train yourself up to that. But yeah, like pain, again, is a kind of a warning signal from our body a lot of times. The only function that pain really serves is the warning signal, right? Like, hey, you know, if you get shot, this is why pain is so complicated and it's biopsychosocial. It's not just biology. There's people in, in battle who get shot, don't even realize they're shot if it's not a mortal wound because they're their focus and their goal orientation is so high that it doesn't even register with them, right? But 
if you're if you jump up training volume real quick, sometimes your body will start having pain even if there's no tissue damage because it's doing this warning like, hey, we aren't recovering, and under recovery is one of the predictors of acute injury risk. And so your body may actually send you the signal for pain before there's actually even an injury because it's trying to warn you, like, hey, hey, hey back it off a little bit, you know. So what I would say is just in that case, like we'd walk it up a little bit slower and progressively, right? And then as far as training goes, we do see, so there used to be what was called non-responders to resistance training in the literature. And further studies have uncovered that there's actually no non-responders to training. There are lower responders. And typically when they actually take these people's volume up higher, they have a bigger response. So what it appears to be, and, and yes, of course, like there's probably genetic ceilings to how much you can grow muscle. A lot of that probably boils down to like your, your satellite cell number in terms of overall muscular potential. But you can get the rate at least acutely of muscle growth to match responder growth rates if you increase volume more. So number of hard sets. So think about like intensity is the drug. So how, how hard you train is the drug in terms of proximity to failure. And the dosage is the number of hard sets, right? But just like drugs have a tolerance, training has a tolerance. And so a lot of times when you're, when you're starting a drug for treating something, they'll start you at a low dose and walk you up so your body can build up a tolerance to it, right? And so this stuff goes both ways, right? And so training is like that. So again, there are no non-responders to training, but there are responders who require some more, a, a greater dosage of training to get a similar response as those who don't need as much training. And when it comes to food, typically what you see is people who are kind of like, hard gainers, they say, and I fell into this category as a kid, I was always very skinny, is one, they tend to have really good appetite regulation in terms of like, they're just not hungry that much. Food isn't really a big thing for them. It didn't become like a comfort thing or anything like that. People like me chose other vices, like people pleasing instead. And so, you know, trying to get them to actively eat more food can be difficult. I remember the, so the first time I ever tracked my calories. I remember this. I'd been bodybuilding for like a year. I was reading all the muscle magazines. I was eating protein. And I was like, you know, I got to be eating 4,000 calories a day. Like I've got to be, right? Because I felt full a lot. And I tracked my calories and I was eating on average 2,400 calories a day. And I was like, because there were days where I'd hit 4,000, but then the next day I'd do 1,500, you know, because I wasn't really hungry. And so Again, I had to train myself to be able to tolerate some more food. This kind of opposite, you know, issue of what we're talking about. Most people are obese, but there are some people who have trouble with it. And people who tend to be resistant to weight gain tend to fidget a lot more. They tend to get physically more active without even realizing it. And when it comes to a surplus, you don't need a big surplus. In fact, the research studies have shown like really like maybe like a 5% above your maintenance calorie level. So if you maintain your body weight on say, you know, 2,500 calories per day, you know, you could probably just bring your calories up like 150 calories or something like that on average again. And, you know, that will get you results, you know, over time. But the problem is people are really impatient. They want to see the scale move. They don't like weight fluctuations. And so they just end up going YOLO and eating a crap load of food, gaining way too much weight, way too fast. And then they go, well, now I want to cut. And they just end up in this cycle where they're bulking, cutting, bulking, cutting. And so I'll tell people one track. If you track your calories, you don't have to do it all the time, but if you track it for a while, it's kind of like keeping a budget. It's good to do an audit every once in a while and see where you're at. Cause you really don't have an idea unless you do it. Track everything you see for one week, track every single thing you put in your mouth. And this is helpful for people who have trouble gaining weight and people who have trouble losing weight. Track every single thing you put in your mouth for one week. I promise you, you will learn so much. And if you ever want to be depressed, way out of serving of peanut butter and you'll see why people get obese. Then for people who have a hard time gaining weight, Sometimes, this is why I don't label foods good or bad because everything has a place. Hey, maybe it's time to use some ultra processed foods because I'll, I'll give you one example of a, of a client I had years ago. He's about 170 pounds, very active guy, very fidgety guy, very high level of energy expenditure. And he was eating, gosh, what was he eating? Probably close to 4,500 calories a day, having trouble gaining weight. And he was like, Lane, please, we had gotten him to gain weight. Like he was up 10 pounds over the course of about a year. But he's like, Lane, please don't add any more food. I, I can't take any more. Like I feel like my stomach is going to explode. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you, what are you eating? And all the only things he were eating, was eating was chicken, rice, broccoli, oatmeal, and uh, like peanut butter for fats. And I'm like, yeah, dude, no, no wonder you're 
having trouble, you're eating over 100 grams of fiber a day. Like I love fiber, but hey, there's probably some top end where, you know, it tops out in terms of uh, in terms of like benefits, right? I said, listen, hey, hit your macros like, you know, but have a couple slices of pizza, have, you know, so, something that's kind of hyper palatable, low satiety, right? Like a couple of Pop-Tarts, whatever, you know, Oreos, I, you know, they're not good foods typically, but for you, for your specific goal, you need to get energy in that's not very filling. These things are tools to use, right? And uh, and he started doing that. And he was like, a week later, he's like, oh my God, I feel so much better, you know? And again, this is why we don't want to use personal experience as our guide, because for that person, if they didn't know anything about ultra processed food, they might say, you know, I felt better eating more ultra processed food. Therefore, ultra processed food is good for you. So that's why personal experience is crappy to use compared to science. Yeah, those are some tools and levers that people who are, are hard gainers can use. That's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate the tactical and practical. For the people that want to follow along with you and your work, where should they where should they go? Yeah, so my I would say Instagram is my digital business card, and you can find me at BioLane. Uh, also, my website is BioLane.com, and I'm BioLane on almost all social media. Uh, and I have tools for everything we talked about today. Uh, my website, there's a workout builder, which basically like is all our evidence-based workout programming. So if you don't want to like do the guesswork yourself, it's $12.99 a month and you get access to all of our evidence-based programming as, as tools that you can use to track your, your progress, all that kind of stuff. My app, Carbon Diet Coach, if you can't afford one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching, Carbon Diet Coach is an algorithm-based app that I wrote uh, that does nutrition coaching, algorithm-based. It's very effective. We've had tens of thousands of members we, I just got a, a message yesterday from a guy who lost over 150 pounds using Carbon. It's a great tool. It's on iOS and Android. Then, you know, if you're just looking to learn more, increase your knowledge capacity, I have a research review called Reps where I break down like different research studies in fitness and nutrition into a way that's easy to understand. And then uh, supplement wise, you can see my supplement line right up there. Protein, recovery, pre-workout, sleep. The stuff I talk about, Outwork Nutrition, it's all evidence-based stuff. No, we don't make any crazy claims. It's all third-party tested, you know, very transparent labels in terms of what we include. And then, you know, we do offer one-on-one -on -one coaching as well through Team BioLane. So like through my evidence-based practices, we kind of, you know, handpick people who are experts in what we call the BioLane way, which is evidence-based but practical methods to implement behavior change to get people long-term results. Yeah. So I try to offer a variety of things across the broad spectrum to help try and help as many people as I can. And you can find, you can find all that stuff on my Instagram bio. Beauty. Beauty. We'll have a link to all that in the show notes. Definitely check out Lane's Instagram. It's awesome. So good. I love following your content and your work, man. I'm looking forward to round number two. Thank you so much for joining me today. And for everybody that is out there tuning into this, don't forget to man it forward and share it with somebody that you know will enjoy this content and this conversation. Flex it out. <laughs> and until next week, this is Connor Beaton signing off.